Okay, welcome everybody to the Media Education Lab Summer Webinar Series. My name is Jenna. I'm an intern with the Media Ed Lab, and I am very excited to introduce our first session, Media Literacy Practices with Resilience by speaker Maria Leonita. So Maria is a media tutor and a documentary film director. She has been designing projects about the creative aspects of media language for a range of learners in formal and non-formal settings in vulnerable groups since 2003. She is the co-founder and director of Carpos, which is an NGO focusing on media literacy and running European projects. She aims to inspire a wider creative input to audiences and her curricula are a part of several EU and national schemes. Um, this webinar is one hour. We will have time at the end for a Q&A where you'll all be able to turn on your microphone and ask any questions. Uh, if you prefer to just leave questions in the chat, you can do that at any point during the webinar and I will make sure they are answered at the end. Um, and so with that, I will leave it to Maria. We are very lucky to have her and I will hand things off to you. Okay, so... Uh... Hello to everybody. I'm talking to you from Athens, Greece. It's a hot evening here for those who are near the Mediterranean. So um, we have the air conditions on. I hope the noise is not so bad. Uh, as Jenna, I, first of all, I want to thank Jenna and Rene and Yonti for inviting me. The, uh, the presentation I will make is kind of this uh, part of a presentation I, ha I made in Brussels this March at the Media um, Literacy Matters Conference, which took place there, which was quite a big event, an international event. And there, I have received quite a lot of interest on these techniques, so I thought I would like to share them with a wider audience and go th through them again. So um, what I've been mainly showing, and I will start uh, sharing my screen in a while, um, is uh, a, a um, a collection of simple activities, exercises, techniques, I would say, all of which are related to expression, to audiovisual ex expression, mainly visual expression in this session, uh, with vulnerable groups. And uh, my experience in that field starts uh, already 20 years ago working with refugee children, but during the period of 2000, um, 17 to 22, I had the chance to work uh, really thoroughly with these groups because, as you know, in Greece, we were uh, a country that was uh, respecting uh, a big number of uh, refugees from the Asian Africa. So there were many schemes here through municipalities or other uh, NGOs where photographers, film directors or uh, youth workers were working with these groups. I don't want to go on talking a lot, but this experience for me was, um, it actually sharpened and made my, my theory more practical and more acute, how to create and use these uh, tools, these materials with a variety of groups. So this is what I'm going to be talking about and it will be a very practical thing. Would I share my screen now, Jen? Is that okay with you? Sounds good. Thank you. Let's check if this is working. And I'll try. I hope you can see my first slide. Is that? That looks good. Okay, thank you so much. And actually, I'm very honored and touched that people from all over the world are here. So thank you very much for your for your time. It's uh, it's really a pleasure. And I'll look forward to your comments and, and uh, notes and ideas and uh, anything. So I call it media literacy practices with resilience because this is what it means whether you have a, vo a, a volatile and flexible educational material. This is my, my, my scope and my aim. Um, okay, this is just a, a short visual example of what, what I'm going to be using. So these are very tight close-ups, which for me as a filmmaker is the essence of uh, audiovisual language. And you will see in the next slides and the next techniques, a lot of such work, which can be very personal, very expressive, very, it raises questions and it can be an excuse or a reason for discussion among people, whether this is the, the facilitator or the group itself. 
And the camera, as you know, or the mobile phone, it doesn't matter, allows for a huge variety of expressive moments. I think our role as uh, facilitators, uh, as a media educator, is to show to people these possibilities. I don't think that usually they realize what a treasure they have in their hands. So what is this wider media literacy I'm talking about? Is a, is a, is a, is a curriculum which should be applicable to a variety of audiences. It should, uh, it should be possible to use with a var varied audience. And, and there we have different kinds of contexts to, to, to work with. And I'm personally very interested and I always test my materials with different uh, generations, different um, age groups, and also with uh, um, interdisciplinary themes. Because working in Greek schools a lot, I am very fond of having film work or media work um, related to all kinds of uh, school subjects. So I think we should all feel feel capable of uh, collaborating with all sorts of uh, curricula. Usually when we have a, a vulnerable group uh, assigned to us, there are some factors that are usually the, the, the issues we have to face, the factors that we are given. And this is usually the literacy level of the people, the language. If there is a common language, we might not have a, even a common language with them working with migrants and refugees, um, you're probably aware of, the, of this, that it can happen. So you also have to be very, I mean, there's body language there that can help you. There's not much that can help. And images is a great tool for that. Um, then the age, as I said, and the background of the group. So we have four factors. And then we have then the context, which should be very important. What is the time frame you have as a, as a facilitator? Is it one hour? Is it five hours? Is it once a week? Is it three months? So these are always very important so that you're able to, 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 to regulate what's happening, what's this, the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of, your, of your activity. And of course, what is the goal? Is the goal artistic expression? Is it learning English? Is it empowerment? Is it uh, bringing people in a relationship with one another? Uh, there could be a variety of goals. So these are things that we should all, always be aware. And I always take into consideration these and the next four factors so to adjust the activities I will later show. So the factors, as we all know, we, those people who are dealing with media education is the techniques, which means what sort of activity is this? What equipment do we need? What is the, the digital media that we will be using? What is the result of what we're doing in, in practical way? Uh, then the aesthetics, how much importance will we give to the aesthetics or it will be more the process that we are aiming at? Is our group able to deal with aesthetic or not yet, maybe at a later stage? The theme, there should always be a theme, I think, because people can connect to the theme. And the how strong the collaborative element, how, how much group work is part of our goal, or we are aiming at an um, uh, individual uh, activity or pairs only working. These things are very crucial, at least for, for me. Uh, and now I would like to show you a little bit of how I'm thinking when I'm picking up the tools that I'll be using or the, the little media that I will be using to adjust my, my, my educational material. As we all know, audiovisual language is very complex and it, it encompasses very different and very independent, strong units. Script in terms of text, in terms of the dramaturgy is one thing, text as language, as uh, uh, phrases, as titles is also a very strong independent uh, medium. Then photo means still, still images, video and audio. Each one of them is a very strong and complicated thing, which will demand you know, expertise from each one of us. Uh, I believe that the, if, we're, if we're dealing with them, if we're using them as 
pieces of a puzzle, this helps us um, control them more. And because each one of them is able to give us more layers of uh, storytelling, more layers of expression, more layers of uh, combining them. Because sound, for example, is helping us to tell stories, to create images. Also, language, speech is sound itself. And people can also be part of the creation of sound. These are already three different ways to deal with sound. Each one of these uh, puzzle pieces could be the, the goal and the, the, the framework or, or the, the field of working a whole month with a group. One could work honestly with speech as sound for, for every day for a whole month, from simple uh, nouns and words to complicated sound storytelling. So, and, and there comes, of course, the question of the equipment. Are we ready to deal with that? Is it cheap equipment? Is it our mobile phone? Is it professional equipment? Are we going to spend time to show how this equipment work or is it not necessary? And what, what is the space of creativity we're going to, to give to the people? So um, going back to those puzzle pieces, I think we need to find uh, the way we are going to build our final educational material. What is, which part is, is first and which is second and third? If you have a microphone in your hands, for example, you could start by recording uh, stories, which is already quite developed. Or you could start by recording sound effects. Or you could start by recording rhythmic elements. So each one of our choices is creating, has an impact, has a, a brings specific results. And it would be good for us to be aware of the plurality of the compl complex issues that come with each one of those uh, elements in audiovisual language. And uh, working with those groups for me was a uh, good chance to adapt and readapt and compare and reevaluate my work because very often you fail, as you know, with uh, difficult groups or even with mainstream groups. Uh, it's not, it's never easy sometimes. <laughs> so it's a very good chance to refine your techniques, I would say. And the educational materials demand from us when we create them a, a lot of uh, flexibility, a lot of honesty, I would say, to re, to compare, observe what, the posi what we did, what we did not, what we forgot, uh, what was the highlight of a session. What happened during a specific media literacy moment, I could call it, because there are moments within sessions that are exemplary or are stunning, or one of our members might bring something out that we've never thought of, as you know. And the point is that you're aware of what happened and when. So then you can steal ideas from yourself. You can steal ideas from your own group. This is what I mean. You you. Uh, create new parts of your own educational materials. So this is about restructuring and testing. So testing and restructuring. And this is why I believe a lot in testing my materials with different audiences, because different target groups will reveal other qualities of the same educational material. And let's go on to show some examples. So this is all the next slides are related to things I've been doing with uh, minorities and with uh, vulnerable groups. And often the language was very, very limited. So this is um, something we do with uh, postcards, which are of course selected. They're not randomly picked from the internet, but we have created a pool of postcards which offer different possibilities. And the way you see them here organized, they were organized by specific uh, people. One person used the postcards and built this pyramid or this uh, parallel layer, which means that this is in a way 
a kind of paper editing, I would call it. And you don't need to speak English or Greek to do that. It's just a, um, you can use your instinct and your visual experiences for that. And after building this uh, scheme, each person would come up with describing their own story. And believe me, uh, people suddenly remember even 10 words they know in English and they can describe uh, their whole story with a minimum of, uh, of language uh, possibilities. Uh, this is also a continuation with people that are um, have a part of written literacy. And again, the postcards, uh, I usually pre prefer to use the minimum form of a storyboard with three pictures. And then uh, the person can try to write uh, ideas, images, uh, even dreamlike uh, phrases that come from the pictures that they chose. This can go vice versa. You can see that this was from image to text, and then it was from text to image. The image on the right was created. So we wrote first some memories, and, and that person was uh, in prison. So then I said, okay, take a camera, go out for a while and find something that would animate your, your phrases. And, and he found this staircase, which reminded him of the staircase of the prison he was in. So immediately we have this iconography that is built up in, in very short time. Then, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there's a close-up, which is, I believe, very much in the close-ups because they are also... Um, they can be very personal, they can be very enigmatic, they can be very suggestive, and they show to the other people exactly what we are looking at. It's the only kind of shot in film language that cannot be misinterpreted. What can be misinterpreted is the actual uh, thing they portray because it can be also very suggestive as you see I don't know if you can recognize what this is but these are little little tiny observations from the space we were having our course and for example the ones I showed in the beginning are again different uh, enigmatic details that the participants chose from their environment during our session and that was done in more, not more than 15 minutes uh, and I think that one was with mobile phones. So the thing is to have a clear script, send them out and come back to discuss and, and uh, bring together the details that they brought and try to guess. Uh, the other people can try to guess what that is and why. what, it, what was the suggestion about it. Then going further away from the close-up, uh, that was related to a more, let's say, learning English session. So we use very clear signs. It, it's a part of semiotics as well. So the color is self-explanatory to everybody. And through the color, we can focus on objects. And that was a, a possibility to help them learn uh, a vocabulary that was necessary for them. At the same time, it was an exercise uh, to produce uh, visually interesting images uh, in, uh, of course, a very low budget way without um, going far away from uh, the classroom we were working on. And then this is a very favorite exercise I'm doing to very, very different audiences. Uh, even um, I've been working with uh, uh, corporate groups and it works very well with them. Uh, so with, with the mobile phones, we create um, a series of images which are the result of working in pairs and each one in the pair is choosing a detail that is meaningful to them from their peer. So it's a peer building, a peer relationship exercise and then the, the magic of it is that you can immediately, in seconds, share the result, produce a, uh, this collage, as I call it, and discuss about it. 
And what I also like in this exercise is that um, that mobile phone, which usually is a very personal thing, becomes something that is a, a screen that people share and nobody remembers, nobody knows exactly whose was which phone. So it's a quite a democratic uh, activity that um, brings people closer. And um, it's not hard to make people even of older age to understand the point of it. Uh, see, you see, as this was connected to an English uh, learning um, course, photography in English, that immediately we were introducing um, uh, the words related to that uh, collage. And um, going further again with the portrait, which is very common, but it's always useful to do, and a little bit of writing on the side, which is uh, uh, useful with uh, black and white copies. Again, not expensive, low budget stuff. And here again is another activity related to the puzzle I showed you, but here we have introduced the meaning of action, of taking take uh, uh, movement, of uh, doing something, of saying something about yourself in a point of activity. So again, it is a field that, uh, um, a layer that gives people the possibility to share uh, and start talking about things they want to do. And here, um, with a simple image editing app, we introduced a little bit of, let's say, storytelling. And actually that was after the quarantine. So I was asking them, how did you spend your time? What did you do? So they immediately in sec in very few minutes managed to practice uh, the, the few words they knew by introducing uh, actions and everyday habits they had, they had during the quarantine. And then groups could compare and discuss what the difference was from this experience. Again, the same thing, a post-quarantine sharing everyday habit uh, activity. And uh, uh, Jenna, do we have time to go on or should we stop for the breakout rooms? You have some more time. We have about 10 okay. minutes. Like to okay. talk so here, here is, uh, for example, um, how they felt about what we were what we were doing in this photography and English course. So, uh, as you can see, they, they they like to show that they gained some um, confidence about speaking. And here, um, again, another participant connects photography with language and the whole experience of exploring photography in a more focused way. Uh, and I like the fact that he says, because it was difficult, that means that it was difficult. So that means that he, he developed some skills in that case. And I just want to encourage you that these activities, most of them uh, have been doing in online situations during periods of the current time. So this is the same close-up activity, but in a Padlet. So this is just a screenshot from a shared Padlet that was shared between me and, and three groups in three different refugee camps, and it still worked. So uh, I gave them the activity, we clarified the point, and they went out and made some photos, they uploaded, and already they they made some comments. So. It's been tested, so feel free to use it. And this is also another thing we did online. Um, it's an early, another little exercise where we can use a, a silhouette photography, which has the advantage of not uh, betraying the, the faces of people and can let them focus on shapes and talk about shapes, about pose, without uh, feeling exposed if they don't want that. And I think I'll stop here because this is a much a more complicated activity. If we finish at the end, I will share it with you. So I will stop sharing here um, in case uh, people would like to have a first reaction before we move to a, a breakout rooms, Jenna?
Sure. So yeah, we're going to move to breakout rooms to to discuss and reflect on the activities that we saw. Before we do that, I just want to ask one question ahead of time uh, before we go into the breakout rooms. Sue Ellen was asking if you could please explain the myself exercise with peers one more time. Okay. Um, the one with the mobile phones is... Uh, I, I believe so. Yes, that's uh, correct. Okay. So uh, I can... I could share again so that it's more visually more. Uh, so are we talking about this? Is this uh, the I one? Think it, was the, it was two before that. Uh, yeah. This one. Okay. Okay. So this Thank is you. the hit. This is the hit. Okay. So this is actually, I have stolen some techniques from theater pedagogy, which was uh, something I really respect and like. Um, so uh, if people are, imagine people in a circle or in pairs, it depends. And then you have eye contact with one person. If you're in pair, then it's very simple. If you're in a circle, you, you have eye contact with one person opposite, for example, and you concentrate and the script is choose something from the other person that you're very interested in, something that you that is meaningful for you from the other person. So for example, one person here chose a jean jacket from the person from their pair, and, and, and that person chose the tattoo from their um, corresponding person. Is that more clear? The thing is that the, the, the object or the detail you choose from the other person, since you chose it because it's, it's important for you, it means that you're able to talk about it. It means that you're able to explain. For example, I chose the stopwatch on the left because I'm always stressed about time and because uh, this reminds me of um, uh, discussions with other people who cannot understand that. Or maybe another option would be because I chose this, this clock, this watch, because my father once gave me this as a present when I was 18 years old. So there are many different kinds of connotations and connections that one uh, can bring because of a specific object or a specific detail. And actually, when I talk to you about this watch, actually, I'm, I'm revealing things about myself mm -hmm. uh, through the excuse of something that's, that belongs to you. But it, it is my point of view what I chose. Yes, that's very yeah. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's 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 a lot of activities. So uh, each one of them would need to be explained more. But uh, the idea of, let's say, selecting, carefully focusing and selecting, I think is behind all what I showed before, because the close-up shot is what teaches you how to choose, and um, I believe that. All filmmaking and narrative and storytelling is about focusing on details. And this is how we explain our uh, imagination and our interpretation of the world. So still photography is actually a wonderful tool for that. It's simple, it's cheap, and everybody can understand, you know, whether they are 10 years old or 80 years old, I think they can still focus on a detail. So it, it, would there be any other question, maybe? Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and break everybody into breakout rooms. Bear with us as we get this figured out. Uh, we will have about 10 minutes in the breakout rooms. When we come back, we'll have a little group discussion and time for questions. Could, could I, Jenna, could I give a, a, a question for the breakout room? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to uh, just share... Uh... The same, okay, is this, can you see that? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to remind you what we saw earlier. So what I would like in the breakout rooms is 
try to remember the different ways that still images were used. So this is ready-mades, as I call them, but personal stories, image to text and text to image, yeah? And then the close-up as a interpretation of my own vision, again, the close-up, um, the common element, a common thread among shots here, the yellow, which reveals different possibilities. The action, the activity, uh, the portrait activity, let's say the myself activity through selecting something from another person. Uh, and the image editing, creating small collages with uh, uh, little titles and intertitles. So these are actually, I'm just reminding you um, in short, some of the possibilities with just using still images. So I would like you to discuss, uh, bring some uh, questions, new ideas, uh, feedback, uh, possibilities, or how would you use one of these in your own uh, working space? Yeah? All right, we have 10 minutes. We will be sending you all to rooms now. All right, welcome back everybody. I hope you all had a good chance to get to know each other a little more and, and discuss everything we just heard. Um, before we get to the, the Q&A portion of this, would anybody be interested in sharing something that you talked about in the breakout rooms? And you can just, you can turn on your microphone and talk out loud or you can send it in the chat and I will read it out loud. Um, I would love to share what me and my partner spoke about. Sure. Um, and thank you, Maria, so much for such an inspiring and informative presentation. Um, I also have never seen so many Greek last names in a Zoom as I am seeing right now, which makes me so happy. My last name is Iotropoulos, so Yasu. Um, but uh, what me and my partner spoke about was just about how useful uh, using visual based texts to speak to different generations can be because at a younger age group you can talk about what feelings they invoke and then for mm -hmm. an undergraduate age group you can talk about how that invocation of feelings can be politicized and weaponized so there's a lot of different room for um going deeper and deeper the more sophisticated you want your students to be thinking mm -hmm. Maria, I'm not sure if you're trying to talk, but you're muted. Sorry. So thank you very much for sharing this, Mary Ellen. Um, uh, any other comments? We talked a little bit about the interesting, we had a videographer, uh, so a practitioner as well as an educator and a student in our in our breakout and something that I thought was interesting was um, discussion about uh, the power of a close-up, but um, also the importance from a media literacy perspective of, to me as an educator, thinking about how we talk a lot about context in, in relation to misinformation. And, our, and so that to me is an interesting vehicle to talk about from both a filmmaking videography point of view of what a close-up does creatively and um, directing the audience attention, but then putting it through the prism of media literacy, how does that um, change your ability as audience to think about the, the information you're getting and the, how might you you act on that if you wanted more information out that what else was outside that close up seemed to me like it could be a really interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you, Suelen. I, I completely agree with you that uh, but um, and I fully agree with you that we can talk about more 
deeper and complex issues of information and how things are manipulated. But it's very crucial if people understand whether they're kids or adults, the power of the close-up and the, let's say the subjectivity of each close-up leads you to understanding manipulation. So there is a, a whole fantasy, a whole expressive power, aesthetic, artistic power in the close-up. And there is also the manipulative power of the close-up. And once people understand that through doing it, then they are much more critical in understanding mass media that are mm -hmm. around them all the time. So I find uh, I prefer to go through the basics and through a more personal artistic thing, because once someone is uh, identified and uses it, then they are much. It's much easier for them to understand uh, news items, uh, videos that are on YouTube or any other thing. So I, I prefer to work on film language per se, and then use it for other things. Um, so in our group, um, if I mean, we, we talked a little bit as well about the policies and permissions uh, associated with, um, with, with the pictures of the individuals who are included, like you have the, the, the silhouette, but for instance, if we are working with underage uh, students, we have to have a parental consent and a lot of time to show any picture of the individual in any kind of a shared format. So uh, we were wondering if, if you have any information on the policies and permissions that are associated with, with using and sharing the, the pictures of the, the individuals in the groups. Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the material I showed you Mm -hmm. is is working without heads yeah and so the detail this is one of the reasons the detail is quite anonymous and it can be anywhere so most of the things even the portraits i did recently did, did the portrait activity with teenagers and i said and there were three refugee kids and the others were bourgeois greeks so that was a mixed group uh, those that didn't want they made portraits with their backs or with different kind of ways of obscuring, you know, their... So I think photography is so rich and we can find ways of, of hiding things that we don't want to show without, without um, restricting the artistic aspect or the expressive aspect. So I think we can get away with permissions and things by infusing the, the script of the activity, you know, the idea of the activity, from the start and not feeling restricted as educators after the activity because we don't have the permission to do something. And I think people are fine if there's, uh, if things are discussed openly, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just I would ask a very practical question, but what software do you actually use to share the images? Uh, uh, you mean for the online sessions or? Uh, no, the in, the in the in person sessions. Uh, usually, uh, it's it's just it can just be a slideshow or it can be Padlet or it can be anything. Uh, I don't give much attention to to software, to be honest. I think we should be able to work with what, what is available. And the good thing with still image, as I said, is you don't need software to show still images. You just put it in the computer and project it. And the idea of the mobile phones as screens, that mm -hmm. even helps you uh, work without projector or TVs. So, or if you have tablets, that's even better, you know, people, some people have tablets, but the, the point for me is create, show and tell. So not much editing. The ones that were edited were in Pic Collage, is a small free app, which is very good. PIC Pic Collage. Sorry to um, interrupt, we just have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I want to make sure we get everybody. I see we have a few hands raised, but I want to just quickly ask a question from the chat from earlier in the presentation. It's from Michael from Ohio. 
Um, and Michael says, how do you decide when and how to test your materials across generations? Are they together or separate or both? Uh, how, how and when I decide to test? What is the last question? Is it together or you separate or both? Yeah, I, I just want to turn on your mic and, and elaborate. Absolutely, you can. I, I hope I, I can. Am I being heard? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, uh, this was so early in your presentation, you might not remember, but you you said an important aspect of what you did was, you know, testing for the audience. And so it was those early slides where you had the technique and, and that. I'm sorry, I'm not remembering all the words. So I've just wondered, how do you go about that? I, I teach adults and social work. So media literacy is like a big, big add on uh, to what we do. And I, I hate saying it like that because I think it's so important, but it does come out that way. So and, and I teach uh, adults to all students are over the age of 18, but they can be uh, I've had students as old as 70 uh, and that and I have a, a range. But uh, I thought you might have meant more even more intergenerationally when you spoke and so then i wondered how do you um go about you know i, I didn't know if you meant you were testing the activities or testing the results or or okay. what and i just wondered methodologically how you decide yeah. uh you know how you'll do which where okay that's a wonderful question of course because that's the essence of what i've been trying to to, to say um the truth is i'm a i'm quite a a, a person who is very I work with experience and it, with improvising based on what I have to be honest. So, uh, um, however, I, I'm ba always based on some methodology. My experience says that don't risk too many things at the same time. For example, if an activity, one of the WEM, has worked once in a relatively safe, safe area, safe space, I should not test it by adding too many new factors. Let's say the postcards, which is very simple. Yeah. If you have a set of postcards that has worked or you're just trying it, uh, it would be difficult to suddenly uh, duplicate the number of postcards, really make them too many or try a very different style of pictures or try a very obscure style of pictures, a very enigmatic. So I think that changes and, and risks should be taken little by little. A and then each audience, um, I think we, as educators, we have to be very open-minded and ears open, eyes open, to observe the little, the reactions of the people. And very often, um, uh, you you observe how they interpret your um, the material you offer, and if something doesn't work, I I push back, I pull back. You know, <laughs> I have to. So I would say, in terms of methodologically, I keep the basic idea of the exercise, and I change one minor factor each time. And that is the way I push my own boundaries. All right, I out of the hands raised, I saw Pia's first. If you would like to ask your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I hope I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to um, follow up on, on the images and what we said about the um, close-ups. And I think um, what I find really interesting is, is that, um, yeah, images, um, when we think about them, we usually consume them also in a personal space, like on social media, for example. and um, we don't realize how fast we jump to uh, conclusions. And then if we put images in a social context and we actually realize that everybody has a different interpretation, especially on a, on a close-up, um, this is, I think, super valuable. Um, and also in the context of uh, media literacy um, to realize, yeah, how much, um, how much everybody has, has different associations with, with an image. Um, my question maybe um, is also uh, on the, the, the group size, uh, which is something that um, interests me. Um, what, what, is, what was your experience? And also, uh, if we have time, um, whether you have experienced um, if 
students who usually don't engage so much um, in the classrooms and in, in, in um, different settings, learning settings, um, start to engage more. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think your question is at the right moment. It, it's one of the factors is the group size, of course. I might have forgotten to mention it, but, uh, and it is, it can be hard. It's different to work with 10 than 25 people. We know that. So, uh, and we often find ourselves just having to deal with that. Pairs or small groups, let's say with one phone, three people can still work or four people can work with one phone. You know, it doesn't matter. So that was one thing I have adjusted. Uh, so the phone is a screen for a small group. So immediately they are busy, three or four people around one phone. This is one way, for example. Or um, you, I would say in a simple way, keep people busy, keep people busy with something. And, and my idea is to decompose the elements of the activity into smaller pieces. Anything can be decomposed at least in two things. Any activity, any action, any script, any uh, media literacy moment can be broken into pieces. So this is what I usually do. I keep people busy with assigning them a smaller part, but I find that images and audio, of course, are not easy things. If you want to make them good, it takes time. I'm I'm very against just clicking and going away. I send them back. I say, oh, that's wonderful, but maybe the background is not so clear or there are things coming, you know, ugly things jumped in your image. Why don't you try again to make it more clear, more focused, more acute? What is your message? So people can be busy and by in that way they are they collaborate more. So sometimes a bigger group can be even more fruitful, you know? And then you can use the method of a spokesman for the group. They can have a little discussion to decide. I also use very much, even in video workshop, which is so much more complicated, they always, are asked to select their material before bring it, coming back to me. Because this is actually like editing before, because usually people take many pictures or loads of video shots. I don't want to see all these. I say, please come back to me with three good pictures. So it takes time to select out of 10 to make three, you know? And it, 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 it makes them realize that it's so useful to learn to delete stuff. Yeah, I tried to con discussion as well. Yeah, sorry. I know, I just, I mean, I want to say that I'm very fond of convincing people to start deleting stuff on their phones. All right. I, <laughs> this awesome. is my, yeah, that, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, we have time for one more question. And I see Scott has had uh, her hand raised for a while. So go ahead if you'd like to take our last question. Oh, all right. Well, we may have lost Scott. Um, if anybody else. Oh, all right. Me... Sorry, oh, I'm, I'm back again. Um, thank you. Uh, we talked about the power of when you, when you, combine images together to tell a story. Um, and I do a lot of digital storytelling. Um, in fact, I was uh, certified from the Story Center in digital storytelling. And I and one of the things that I brought up um, was um, how, you know, we're oftentimes told to pick an image or we oftentimes are told to make an image that is meaningful to us. But I liked all the different approaches that you had. So um, I, I just um, I just thought that we just thought that was a, a pretty interesting facet and, and similar to what PM had mentioned also. Um, um, oh, geez, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting right now. Okay, it's okay. Um, well, oh, the various interpretations of images. And I mentioned how that can be a catalyst for critical thinking in the classroom. When people, you were mentioning all the different classes of individuals, the students that you had in some classes, the bourgeois um, versus the not, well, that kind of same idea where we can see where people are coming from by their 
uh, mere interpretation. Sorry, I lost my thought there. It's Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. All right. And we are exactly at time. Uh, I think we're going to wrap things up here. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we will be back on July 23rd for our next session. It's titled Media Literacy, Moral Panic, and Video Games, Learning Through Play with the Glika Ivanova. Um, I'm actually just going to send the registration link in the chat if any of you are interested in. Um, but also thank you to Maria very much for presenting. I think we all found your presentation very engaging and applicable to so many of us. Maria's information uh, is on our website. You can feel free to drop any links or emails in the chat if you would like. Uh, and with that, depending on where you are in the world, have a great rest of your day or night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for joining this and it will be my pleasure to meet you again in another session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always a pleasure Hi. to hear from you, Maria. Thank you very much, Yonti. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everybody.